think fame and success is sort of available to anybody who wants it, but it takes a lot of work and an incredible amount of desire, and she does have, obviously she has talent, but more than that, she has an incredible desire for it, and, and she's designed her whole life around accommodating that desire. determined person I know and the most driven uh, and I mean I know a lot of people who are in the industry performers and um, she works a hundred times harder than all of them you know work is is her ritual you know it's like breathing for the rest of us it's sort of unnatural in a way <laughs> push myself so hard because I have demons because I'm because I want to live forever because I because when I die I don't want people to forget that I existed because I'm constantly looking for the truths in life and maybe I I'm afraid if I stop, I'm going to miss out on something, you know? So, because I have so much energy that if I sat around for too long, I'd probably explode. In um, the 10 years I've been training people, I've never met or worked with someone who has a drive, male or female, that Madonna has. When Madonna and I first met, she had a, a body that was in good shape, but she didn't have quite the definition. Uh, she was a little more voluptuous, a little softer in her arms, her legs, and her upper body. Um, a lot of people like, referred to her at that time like a, a cherub. What we did uh, is get involved in a program that not only strengthened her entire cardiovascular system and her muscular system, but when you do something like that, you're going to lose a lot of body fat and become more leaner, which will give you the more definition. Uh, one of the things that, that was really kind of shocking for people to, is to see that transformation in, in that period. kind of something amateurish about her. She was kind of chubby, and it was kind of cute, you know, and audacious. But she's much less accessible now, I think, you know? As the machine around her has gotten bigger and bigger, she's disappeared more and more. Now, you know, now she's almost, you know, like the, the mysterious energy cell at the center of it, but you don't really see her. You see 
these things that she creates more than her. Picture by Freda Kahlo that Madonna has, I think it's called Birth. Uh, and there were several versions of it that Freda Kahlo did. Um, and Madonna has one of these pictures, and she said, Nobody who doesn't like this picture can ever really be my friend. Now, this is this is a hard picture to take. It's a picture of completely grown-up Freda Kahlo being born. It's unnatural. Adults don't get born. And this sense of being born whole of being born grown up is also something absolutely crucial, I think, to what Madonna's about. And obviously, if you can create yourself, you can continue to recreate yourself. Change is important because it means that you've grown. And it, mean, it means that the life that you've lived, that you're living, has affected you. I feel insecure sometimes and I don't know who I am, but it doesn't have so much to do with me changing as, as it's about having your, your own image and your face and your personality being made larger than life and in a way dehumanized. So when that happens, you almost sort of look at that and I look at me and I say, that's not me, that I'm me. I'm this human being, you know, and that's not a human being. So sometimes I feel insecure and about that and I don't know who I am, but it really doesn't have much to do with me changing my images. Cause that's just me acting out fantasies and, and acting out all the different sides of my personality, which are all part of me. public can project their own fantasies. She um, has been very clever at exploiting the need for a certain kind of star, the blonde bombshell, which every generation has to have. And she impersonates that role rather than fulfills it. She puts it on like a suit of clothing. And it's not especially natural to her, but she does it with a great deal of conviction. Also, it, it partakes of that great aesthetic of the 1980s, which people have called postmodernism, but which might more accurately be termed shopping, which is that the world and all of history is a vast supermarket, and you can just pick out <coughs> the ingredients you like and assemble them into your own version of something. I chose the whole Metropolis setting because I, it's really my tribute to that movie. I mean, I love Fritz Lang's movie. And the whole idea of, of men being sort of chained to that, that work ethic. But that, I considered that to be the very masculine, male-dominant world, and my world was feminine. The theme of Express Yourself is It's a very crass 
Well, it's very crass, but basically is that pussy rules the world. Okay, I said it. The cat was a metaphor, you know what I mean? And it, but, but it represented femininity, and I think that there is that side in all men, as well as there's the masculine side in me. That's why eventually I went into that world, and I wore a suit, and I had a monocle, and I behaved as a man. Everything I do is ironic and controversial because I like to change everything around and say, well, what if it was this way and what if it was that way? No matter how in control you think you are about sexuality or a relationship or a power struggle that exists in a relationship, there's always a certain amount of compromise that takes place and a certain amount of sort of being beholden to someone if you are in love with them. And it doesn't matter how in control you think you are. But it's something that you choose to do. And no one put the chain around my neck I, except me. So <clears throat> I was chained to my desire. What you need. absolutely amazing when you think that she's come from someone rolling around on the floor with a buckle that says boy toy to um, the video of like a prayer which is blasphemy on about 10 levels at once which is as strong and as, and as upsetting a piece of public work that you're gonna see anywhere I don't care if it's a sculpture I don't care if it's a speech The song itself conflates worship and prayer with oral sex, okay? You've got that in the song to begin with. Then in the video, you have interracial sex. You have sex between a human being, a woman, played by Madonna in the video, and a saint, a black saint, who may not be a saint at all, may be Jesus. That's just for starters. Now, she is threatening the um, taken-for-granted beliefs of how things ought to be of millions and millions of people. And she's doing it in an utterly naturalistic way. There's no flag that goes up that says, now, blasphemy. Just like the dream, you want you was that Pepsi um, signed up Madonna for something like five million dollars to endorse Pepsi and to make a Pepsi commercial. But at the same time, 
Madonna releases her video for Like a Prayer. And this appears on TV virtually simultaneously with the Pepsi commercial. Well, people went nuts. Certain pressure groups threatened Pepsi with a boycott. Well, with the competition between Pepsi and Coke so fierce, Pepsi instantly backed down and took the commercial off the air. Now, what's the result of this? You can either say, here's Madonna making a fine work that's been suppressed by the evil censors. Or you could say, here's Madonna using the media, the whole idea of, of the American capitalist network, the forces of censorship, to come out with, with more notoriety than she's ever had before and five million bucks. Go ahead. Make a wish. I think it was a triumph. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think controversy makes people think about things. And I don't necessarily want people to say, oh, uh, you know, she's right, but only to challenge their own beliefs. Society, a woman who is overtly sexual is considered a venomous bitch or someone to be feared. So what I like to do is sort of take the traditional sort of overtly sexual like bimbo image and turn it around and say, well, yes, I can dress this way or I can behave this way, but I'm in charge and, you know, I call the shots, or I know I know what I'm doing. Hi, guys. Hi. This guy's a cute boo. Mm. Mm. Way cute boots. Yeah, oh, I'm, do you know yeah. this guy? They're bad. Hey, hey, you guys, choose a dare, choose a dare. Choose a dare. You want to fuck us? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you know, you, you really never get to know a guy until you ask him to wear a, a rubber. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. But you got to do it. Boots. But you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I like to talk about safe sex in, in my shows or, or somehow mention it in, in any way I can because I have such a youthful following and a, and a very large gay following that it's that since I have that, that ear that it's very important for me to be sort of be a spokesperson in a way. So much of my work is about sex because sex is is the reason for everything. I mean, I said it in my show, that's why I'm here. Because my parents had sex. And everything that we do, you know, is sort of geared to that or about that or or I mean <clears throat> sex makes the world go round. Blonde Ambition Tour was an engaging spectacle, partly because you could never anticipate what was going to happen. I don't think anyone in that audience could have come up with, with a, a dramatic fantasy for the song Like a Virgin, anywhere near as extreme as the one that she played out on that stage. Two um, black men uh, dressed up as hermaphrodites with those enormous pointy breasts. Thought, That's what Like a Virgin was about? I thought there was going to be a man in it. 
Nope, no man necessary. Just two hermaphrodite slaves. I mean, you know, the, the complexity of the imagery, not all of it necessarily, you know, acceptable to anybody, was amazing. exercising myself of the guilt of the Catholic Church, meaning in the Catholic Church, sex is considered sinful unless you're married, and masturbation is certainly considered sinful. So first I was, you know, I placed myself in a sexually dominant situation with men waiting on me, and I was masturbating. I know it was all fine until I started masturbating, and then when I started to do that, the, the men went away, everybody went away, because they couldn't deal with my sexual explorations or whatever. God. And then the voice of God appeared and the crucifix came down out of the ceiling and then I was in a church and I was now going to have to be punished or go to confession uh, and deal with the male authority figures, whether that's my father or a priest or the Pope or whatever. So it was to create drama that I did it. The Vatican were like hearing about my show and they were all upset about it and they were putting all this propaganda in the newspapers about my show and just how blasphemous it was. And, and it was all by people who hadn't seen the show. And I was enraged, completely enraged, because how dare they judge it without seeing it. Don't talk. If you talk, I will stop speaking, all right? Se parlate, se ne va! Allora. Allora. Sono un italo-americana e ne vado fiera. Basically, the statement was about freedom of speech and freedom of expression, artistic expression, and, and how important that was in society. Because um, if you don't have freedom of speech and expression, then you're basically living a fascist, fascistic life, and uh, I mean, then. Really, there's no reason to live if you can't say what you want to say. And my show, I really saw my show ultimately as a piece of theater that provoked thought and uh, sort of took you on an emotional journey. I see sadness, I see sour, sorrow, I see joy. I see, you know, religious passion and I see overt sexuality. I see, you know, all these different things. And I, I was describing life. I wasn't saying you should live your life this way. I was presenting my point of view. And, but ultimately I saw my show as a celebration of life. Just like a breath, I think it 